So, as I have said, I have only my perplexities to offer you. I am nearing 70. I have given the major part of my life to literature, and I can only offer you doubts. The great English writer and dreamer, Thomas de Quincey, wrote in some of the thousands of pages of his 14 volumes that to discover a new problem was quite as important as to discovering the solution of an old one. But I cannot even offer you that. I can only offer you time-honored perplexities. And yet, why need I worry about that? What is a history of philosophy but a history of the perplexities of the Hindus, of the Chinese, of the Greeks, of the schoolmen, of Bishop Barclay, of Hume, of Schopenhauer, and so on. I merely wish to share those perplexities with you. I have dipped into books of aesthetics, but I had an uncomfortable feeling that I was reading the works of astronomers who had never looked at the stars. I mean that they were writing about poetry as if poetry were a task and not as it really is a passion and a joy. For example, I have read with great respect Benedetto Croce's book on aesthetics, and I have been handed the definition that poetry and language are an expression. Now, if we think of an expression of something, then we are landed back into the old problem of form and matter, and if we think about the expression of nothing in particular, that gives us really nothing. So that we receive respectfully that definition, and then we go on to something else. We go on to poetry. We go on to life. And life is, I am sure, made of poetry. Poetry is not alien. Poetry is, as we shall see, lurking around the corner. It may spring on us at any, at any, at the moment. Now, we are apt to fall into a common confusion. We think, for example, that if we study Homer or the Divine Comedy or Fray Luis de Leon or Macbeth, we are studying poetry. But books are only occasions for the poetry. And I am reminded now of a poem that you all know by heart. And perhaps you may never have noticed how strange it is. For perfect things in poetry do not seem strange. They seem inevitable. And so we hardly thank the writer for his pains. I am thinking of a sonnet written more than a hundred years ago by a young man in London, in Hampstead, I think, a young man who died of lung disease, of John Keats, and of his famous and perhaps hackneyed sonnet on first looking into Chapman's Homer. Now, what is strange about that poem, and I only thought about it three or four days ago when I was pondering over my lecture, is the fact that it is 
a poem written on the poetic experience itself. You know it by heart, and yet I would like you to hear once more the surge and thunder of its lines, of its final lines. Then felt I, like some watcher of the skies, when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortes, when with eager eyes he stared at the Pacific, and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. And there is a word that seems to me very important, and the word is on first looking into Chapman's Homer. Because this first may, I think, prove most helpful to us. At the very moment when I was going over those mighty lines of Chapman, I was thinking that perhaps I was only being loyal to my memory. Perhaps the real thrill I got out of the verses of Keats lay in that distant moment of my childhood in Buenos Aires when I first heard my father reading the map aloud and when the fact that poetry, that language, was not only a medium for communication but could also be a passion and a joy was revealed to me. I do not think I understood the words, but I felt that something was happening to me, was happening not to my mere intelligence, but to my whole being, to my flesh and blood. And now, let's go back to the words on first looking into Chapman's Homer. I wonder if John Keats felt that thrill when he had gone through the many books of the Iliads and the Odysseys. I think the first reading of a poem is a true one. And after that, we delude ourselves into the belief that the sensation, that the impression is repeated. But as I say, it, it may be a mere loyalty, a mere trick of the memory, a mere confusion between our passion and the passion we once felt. Thus, it might be said that poetry is a new experience every time. Every time I read a poem, the experience occurs or happens to occur, and that is poetry. To end up, I would like to say that we make a very common mistake when we think that we are ignorant of something because we are unable to define it. But if we are in a Chestertonian mood, and that is one of the best moods to be in, I think, then we might say that we can only define something when we know nothing whatever about it. I have a quotation from St. Augustine, and this comes in very fitly, I think. St. Augustine said, what is time? If people do not ask me what time is, I know. If they ask me what it is, then I do not know. And I feel in the same way about poetry.